Hello, and welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. Our topic for today is evidence for spiritual truth. And in that capacity, we are honored to have as our guest, philosopher Sharon Hewitt Rowlett. We'll introduce her shortly, but first let me explain our topic. Course in Miracles students tend to get involved in the course because it speaks to some need we have, it feels right, when we apply it, it works, our lives seem to get better. And yet the course's practical application, which is what we tend to be most interested in, rests on its view of reality. And on that level, the course makes some very bold claims. It envisions a reality that is fundamentally different than what we experience day to day. And those claims it makes might be true, they could be false. If they're true, at least some of them will have evidence for them. And that's not something we talk about much here, but it's a huge issue for me. That's how I got onto the spiritual path originally. In my late teens, I was sort of transitioning out of church and I started reading widely and came across what I felt was stunning surprising evidence for spiritual reality. And that's how this, the whole spiritual journey for me started. So even though it doesn't crop up in our teaching very much, it's never far from my mind. And so that's why Emily and I thought it would be great to invite Sharon Rowlett onto the show because she's a philosopher and writer who's collected a wide ranging body different kinds of non-ordinary experiences that are seemingly impossible to explain within a conventional physicalist framework. Uh, her book on coincidences, which Emily will, will mention soon, has like a million fascinating stories. And she's just written a, an award-winning essay uh, on survival of death, which also has an impressive spectrum of different, often mind-blowing experiences. So why don't you go ahead, Emily? Yeah, so I'll read Sharon's bio. Sharon hewitt Rollett is a philosopher and writer who studies extraordinary experiences and what they have to tell us about coincidences and the deeper consciousness rather, and the deeper nature of the world we live in. She has a PhD in philosophy from New York University and taught for two years at Brandeis University before leaving academia in 2010 for a career as an independent writer and researcher. Her foray into the realm of extraordinary experience began with synchronicities. This is where Robert discovered Sharon, as he mentioned, and in her first non-academic book, her first non-academic book rather was The Source and Significance of Coincidences, which was published in 2019. In 2020, Sharon published a memoir about her personal spiritual journey. This book is called The Supreme Victory of the Heart. And then in November, 2021, she was named as a runner up in the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies essay contest for the best evidence for the survival of human consciousness after death. I'm told that that winning that, or at least being named a runner up was that was a very big deal, Sharon. So congratulations for that. Her winning essay, Beyond Death, was just released in book form. So Sharon, welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, so, so just for our listeners, Sharon is not deeply versed in A Course in Miracles, but she is in the topics we're going to discuss, at least a great many of them. Uh, so the plan is to go through a number of, of teachings from A Course in Miracles about the nature of reality and see if Sharon has what she would consider relevant evidence that you know, strong or weak that supports that idea as, as true. So we thought we could start with the topic of your recent es essay, Beyond Death. Can you, in a relatively short space, I mean, it was a long paper, um, answer the question of, is there evidence for mind as independent from brain and able to survive death? Well, the very short answer is absolutely yes. Um, 
And the longer answer is that this evidence comes from several different types of phenomena that we observe. Some of them are experiences that people have where they seem to have contact with somebody who has passed on and is somehow communicating with them, um, whether this is um, like waking visions of the person, apparitions, uh, whether it's in dreams, very often in dreams. Um, there are even weirder experiences where people will actually get telephone calls. They'll pick up the phone and yeah. they will hear the voice of their loved one, their, their deceased loved one on the other end. And they, in many cases, actually have a conversation with them. I remember um, uh, D. Scott Rogo's book from like the 70s, Phone Calls mm -hmm. from the Dead. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there, there are three whole books dedicated to this topic. There's his book. There's one other one um, that came out, I think, a few years after his. And then there's a French book um, that just came out a few years ago, um, also on the topic. But what's weird about these phone calls from the dead is um, that I actually come across these cases everywhere, like mm. quite apart from people who go out looking for them. Like I... I read tons of memoirs about people who have, you know, paranormal experiences throughout. It's their life. obvious from your writings that you do. Yeah. yeah well, I, I, I love it. I mean, I just soak this stuff up. Um, but it's amazing how many people will just be like, oh yeah. And you know, my dead grandmother called me on the phone this one time. And that was really weird. Like they will just, you know, in the middle of their life, they'll have that one experience, but so many people have them. So in, in any case, that's a phenomenon that, um, a lot of people haven't heard of, but is actually pretty common. Mm -hmm. But aside from those like third person experiences, um, there are also first person experiences of people who actually have been through the experience of dying and remember still existing, still being conscious when their body is dead. So the most well-known cases of this are people who have near-death experiences and then they come back to the same body. But there are also people who have memories of having been another person, that body dying, and then them still being conscious afterward. So they have actually a memory of the in-between state where their consciousness is free of any body. And some of them actually have memories of communicating with their loved ones that they left behind or communicating with their future families um, that they are going to join when they're incarnated into a new body. So there are all of these different phenomena that kind of weave into and, in, and corroborate each other uh, from mm -hmm. all these different perspectives. And I think mm -hmm. that's why when you look at them as a whole, it's very clear, no, our consciousness is not limited to this body. There's something much more that, that we are um, that we're maybe not aware of while we're here in these bodies. And, and a lot of these, am I right, have sort of evidentiary value that people report specific information that gets corroborated. Yes, yes. Um, so some of my favorite cases are these cases of people who remember having lived a previous life and then being in a disembodied state between their lives. And they remember, um, like there's this one case of this boy who remembered having died as a, I don't know, probably a young man in his previous life. And then after dying, he appeared to his previous wife in a dream and told her where he had hidden some money um, not a whole lot of money, but a little bit of money. And he said he put it in this white handkerchief inside of a basket and she should go and find it. So when this boy was reincarnated or, you know, this man was reincarnated as a boy, um, the reincarnation researcher, Ian Stevenson, actually found out about his case, interviewed him about all these details because um, he remembered details about who he had been and, you know, what his profession had been. And so Ian Stevenson was actually able to find the family of the guy that he had previously been. And when he did, the little boy said, well, I want to know, did my wife um, in that life, did she have that dream of me telling her about the money in the basket? And so Ian Stevenson asked her, and indeed she did remember having a dream about the money in the white handkerchief and the basket. And she found it. Um, it had wow. been really comforting to her 
to know that her husband did go on in some way. That's incredible. It yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon, your, yeah. your work is so full of stories and examples like what you've just shared about consciousness surviving the death of the body. And that, that's evidence for that phenomena, right? Let's talk about evidence for the existence of God. This is obviously huge for our audience, of course, yeah. students. So what can you tell us about that? So I was thinking about this in preparation for today because I figured this would be a pretty big topic. And I think that the best evidence, um, I mean, if we're, we're talking, I think actually for each of us personally, probably the best evidence is our own personal experience of some um, of that greater being. But if we're talking about something more objective that we can share with each other, I think that the best evidence comes from near-death experiences because people that temporarily die and come back, of those who feel like they had some experience of um, a greater being of some kind or learned something about the greater nature of the universe, of those people, they almost universally say, yes, God exists. There is a greater consciousness, a greater intelligence, and had some sort of interaction with it. A lot of times it's in you know, the form of a great light. It's very loving and sort of um, embraces them in a way. But other people, they have more of a sense of um, God as this enormous intelligence, like the, the vastness of the information and just beingness of the universe that they're kind of merging with and almost a sense of, of them becoming God as they're moving into this state. There's, there's not a clear boundary between the individual consciousness and the greater divine consciousness. Um, and do you see a consistency in the God that they experience or is it all over the map in your view? No, it's, it's very much a loving God. So there's, there's very much this sense of compassion and also forgiveness for anything that that person may have done that they were ashamed of in their life or that they wish that they had done differently. This being is not the judgmental God that a lot of us grew up learning about. That is just simply not the God that people encounter. They encounter a being that said, it's okay. I love you. It's all going to be fine. Uh, so yeah, it's, you can't, I think one of the things that's most striking about the near-death experiences is that a lot of people will say, well, it's just the expectation that you had going into the experience. Like you expected to see right. God, so you saw God. Right. But there are so many people who have near-death experiences um, who are atheists, and they're surprised that they, well, that their consciousness goes on, but they're also surprised to meet a divine being of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorite examples of this is, because I'm a philosopher, uh, the philosopher A.J. Ayer, mm -hmm. who was an atheist. He was a logical positivist. Like, so he didn't even just think that God didn't exist, but that it was meaningless to talk about the existence of God. Like right. metaphysics just didn't mean anything. So when he was, you know, later in his life in the 1980s, he was in the hospital for some cardiac issue. He temporarily died and his physician went to him afterward because he had heard that he'd had some sort of experience while he was dead. He said, well, what, what happened to you? What was it like to have this near-death experience? And he said, I met a divine being. I'm worried that I'm going to have to revise everything that I've ever said, <laughs> which he ended up not doing, interestingly enough. Um, and it's, it's not clear whether he just sort of realized that, you know, as he got further from the experience, he was like, I don't think it's worth upending, you know, my whole career in this way. Um, but we do have the testimony of that physician who talked to him right after the experience that said that he said he met God. Yeah. So I love hearing that expectation. 
I love it's hearing not. about when people have an interaction with a being that is God as they define it, that he is an unconditionally loving being. So unlike any judgmental or wrathful figure that yeah. we may or may not have grown up with. So the fact that when people encounter God, they have he has the same attributes of love that the God in the course has is always very mm-hmm. exciting for us. So, yeah. Let me ask one more God question, Sharon. Um, you know, in spirituality these days, God is very, very often conceived of as impersonal, as more like beingness or even emptiness or nothingness. Um, in NDEs, do you see signs of God as having agency and intentionality rather than just being an impersonal kind of sea of beingness? Yes. Well, I see both things is the thing, because even if there are these these very constant features of NDEs, like the the feeling of compassion, there's unconditional love, the way that that manifests for different people is variable. Because some people, they're just, yeah, immersed in this sort of ocean. They feel like they're really losing all of their sense of their individual personality um, and merging with the rest of the universe. But then you have other people who have very um, concrete sort of individualized experiences where they feel like they're in this um, landscape and there are other individual beings interacting with them. And sometimes those other individual beings um, they'll identify as Jesus or um, some other spiritual figure. Sometimes they'll just say they're angels or what have you, but there are actually figures who are communicating with them, usually telepathically. It seems like in your death experiences, it all goes by way of the mind. So it's not necessarily words, but there is, there is a conversation happening. There's a, there's an interaction and a back and forth. So I do think I do think that there is there is a, a higher intelligence that has that ability to interact with us in a very personal way. But I also think that there's a level at which even that can be transcended uh, and, and that those more personal characteristics do fall away. So yeah, both and I think. What strikes me is, is the super common instances where Andy ears say that they they met the light maybe merged with the light but the light which they often don't want to call god because of the baggage around that term yeah another argument against it all just being expectation um but they off the light often will say you know hey you've got to go back <laughs> you know and they'll yeah. say i don't want to go back and sometimes it's like nope you're going back yeah and so, you know, it speaks to them. They, I've even got descriptions that I've, I've collected of, of how they describe the voice sounding. Hmm. So it seems like there is, at least, you know, to me, that there is an intentionality, even at that very, very high level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go ahead. you're going to go, go ahead and say something. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I was just going to say, I think... Even if NDEs are not definable in terms of expectation, I think there is a large extent to which they respond to the specific need of the person who's having them, which the person isn't always aware of, or they're maybe not even, it's maybe a need that they don't want to have fulfilled, you know, in the case of an atheist who discovers that there is a God. But those experiences um, are gonna speak to us in in the most useful way for us, for whatever it is that they're intended to do in our life. Because I do think that there is a purpose behind them. It's not a random, you know, break uh, through into this other realm. It's something that was very carefully planned and allowed to happen. And people were allowed to have the memory of it once they returned to earth. And so I think there's intentionality even in the structuring of the NDE and the way that um, that intelligence appears to us. I'm thinking particularly of Elizabeth Crone's near-death experience. So she 
she was struck by lightning um, like 30 years ago um, and was dead for a couple of minutes, although she said it felt like two weeks on the other mm -hmm. side. Uh, but when she first got over to the other side, she actually was interacting with a figure that looked like her uh, deceased grandfather that she was very close to. And what's interesting is that she says that she, she sort of knew that it wasn't her grandfather. Not that it couldn't have been, but she was like, I don't think it was actually him. I think it was another being that was taking on that form because that was the way to make me feel most at ease and to connect with me the best. Hmm. And interestingly, she later had an experience. She actually had a phone call from the dead from her grandfather. And she felt like at that time, it was definitely him. Uh, so she felt like she could tell the difference between these two things. So I do think that the appearances sometimes are just appearances that are, are made to help us, but they're intentionally chosen appearances. So there is an intentional right. consciousness yeah. projecting that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Emily, what were you going to say? Well, I'm just fascinated by the concept of relationship as you're describing what it's like on the other side from these experiences from people who've had NDEs. And so much of the spiritual community, in the spiritual community, we feel like the goal is non-dual awareness. And, and in the course, heaven ultimately is that. There is mm -hmm. no separation. But... But when we're describing God, often in the spiritual community, it's like we are God. And, and what you're talking about, uh, the Course doesn't agree with that, by the way. What, what you're talking about is, is a relationship with him. There's a, there's a distinction there between us and, and him. And there's a distinction between us and other pe people on the other side, that there is this multiplicity there. And that's in alignment with what the Course teaches. And so I'm just wondering if you could say more about the fact that we're both one and there is that distinction between us on the other side. Yeah, well, I think, again, it goes back to sort of levels because even on the other side, it's not like everything is the same. It's not like once you die, suddenly you are exposed to absolute reality. Some people do have that feeling that, that suddenly they were plunged um, it, into sort of absolute non-duality. And if, for some of them, it's a frightening experience because there's this feeling that nothing exists except for me. Like that there's only one thing. And they're like, but, <laughs> you know, that, that's a little bit, um, it's so different from our normal way of conceiving the world that it, that can be frightening for people. Uh, but but there are lots of other sort of um, levels on the way to that absolute non-duality. And on the other side, I think you have levels where people still have a lot of their individuality. They still have a lot of their personality characteristics from their earthly lives, which they're, they're carrying with them mentally. Um, but then the, you can move sort of out of that and you can start to to lose some of those characteristics and to gain some of the characteristics of uh, other people and of other divine beings so does it feel to you like we graduate with our own spiritual evolution to higher and higher levels there are definitely people who talk about that i don't i don't know that i would be I'd be willing to say that it's definitely a progression with, with like graduation, because it seems like some people, they automatically hop to, you know, like the, the completely non-dual experience, maybe before they were even ready to. Um, so it's not necessarily that you can't get there without going through these other steps, but it might not be very pleasant or, you know, you might not be able to fully appreciate the experience. If you yeah. Know. The course says something about more traumatic than beatific. And that's, that sounds it, like what I, you're talking about. That sounds exactly like, I like that description of it. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and just, just to sort of close that loop in terms of the course, especially for our listeners, um, the course has an interesting way of, of sort of straddling both sides where even at the highest level where there's no form, there's no separation. 
we're completely one with God, there is still some kind of distinction where God is still creator and cause, and we are still effect. And there's still a multiplicity of us. Like I'm still me and you're still you, even though there's no form and no boundaries and all is one, which is very paradoxical, but that's kind of its picture. Anyway, uh, part of that picture is that that's in the course of teaching, the only thing that's real and everything below that, even beautiful afterlifes, anything that has form, color, events, um, is, is a dream. And so <laughs> do you see evidence for this world being a dream? Well, or illusory. Yeah, no. So the first answer is yes. Um, I mean, just looking at near death experiencers, I mean, they so often come back and they say that, you know, dying was like waking up from a dream. Like that world is so much more real than the world that we're walking around in here. So yes, actually, um, I love something that NDE or Natalie Sedman says. She talks about, uh, so she actually got, um, she got partially blown up by a mine in Iraq. Um, and uh, while that happened, she experienced the other side. And she says that it was like, or, or coming back to earth was like watching a dinosaur movie from the 1950s. Hmm. Like everything seemed so fake that she couldn't even be like scared by it. Like bad things would happen. She'd just be like, but it's just like terrible special effects. <laughs> um, once you've experienced the other side, it's just like this world just doesn't have the clarity and the, the realness that that side does. So I, I think, yeah, in that sense, this world is a dream. Um, but in another sense, like I, I feel like some people take it too far to where they say, well, it's a dream, so it doesn't matter what I do. Like, just mm -hmm. like, you know, in my dreams, I can do whatever I want. I'm not really hurting anybody. Um, I don't think that's true of this reality because I do think that the this world, certainly the other people and animals in it, but I also think, quite likely the plants and even the physical objects in this world have a measure of consciousness. They, they are experiencing things, even if the structure of this world isn't the ultimate reality, there's still realness to what we're going through here and causing pain to other creatures within this world is not a good thing to do. Um, but I, I don't think you were disputing you, that. But. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir yeah. on that, that point, yeah. for sure. I mean, the that's course, an issue amongst in our community, really. Yeah, and it's yeah. so interesting that you brought that up, having not been a course student, Sharon, that, that there is evidence that this world is a dream, but let's not take that so far so as to be apathetic or uncaring towards each other, towards animals and to the planet in which we live. So I'm so glad that you brought that out because that's the view that we I, share as well. I, I also think that it's important for us to take dreams more seriously because a lot of people, you know, are dismissive of the world because, well, it's just a dream. They don't realize how important dreams really can be because if, if you really pay attention to the dreams that you have while you're sleeping at night, there's a, a deep reality to them that we don't generally acknowledge as a culture. Uh, I mean, just to take a few, you know, one kind of example, a lot of times I'll dream about future events in, in my dreams, or I will dream about something that's happening to a friend of mine that I haven't heard from in a while. And then I'll find out that that thing was actually happening to them. So dreams are not detached from reality. They are very much connected to reality and connected to other conscious beings. But there is a sense in which the appearance of the dream is different than our normal way of interacting with reality. There's a, there's a language to the dream that we have to learn how to decipher. There's symbolism and all these other things. And I think that the same may be true of our life in the physical world. No, it's not the ultimate, you know, 
reality that we will encounter on the other side. But there is a reality to it. And to really figure out what this world is, you have to you have to learn the symbolism. You have to learn the language of this, this physical world and of your relationships with other people. And in fact, one of the things that I learned in studying coincidences for so long is that the coincidences that happen to us, these weird things that happen in the physical world can often best be interpreted the way that we interpret our dreams. There is a symbolism here in the physical world. I think there's a kind of a paradox that, that your remarks and Emily's too have touched on in that, like one of my favorite NDE or quotes is this guy said, um, it's like with Vegas, what happens on earth stays on earth. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. And then, but then if you look at people's NDEs, especially with, with like the life reviews, it's clear that even though what happens here is an ultimately real it's you know we didn't really sin for instance at the same time it's important we're here right. to learn we're here yeah. on missions yeah. and so there's a weird paradox where like it matters and it doesn't matter <laughs> and it's a sign yeah. of spiritual advancement to be able to hold both of those things as true at once you know this is a dream but we should take it seriously because what happens here does matter no. So. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's really difficult in so many different areas. I, I love how many times that the word paradox has come up in our conversation so far, but I think it's really difficult in so many different areas to hold two truths that are intention, but, but that's what you have to do. I think in, to, in order to find the truth in any particular situation or to find the, um, the implications of spiritual truth for what you ought to do, you have to be able to find how those two poles interact in any particular situation. What is the, the, the right point of intersection between them? It's a delicate thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it takes a lot of learning. Um, it takes a lot of trial and error. Actually, one thing I was thinking about going back to the dream question, I, I often think about our reality as like a video game that we're playing. And, you know, while we're playing it, we're like super focused and really involved in it. But then when, you know, mom shuts off the video game because it's time for dinner, then suddenly like we realize that there's this whole other world out there beyond the video game. Now, when you're playing a video game, um, you could play it with, um, some ethics, like you, you could mm -hmm. think about the ethics of the situations that you're in um, and, and play it in a way that's respectful of the other characters that you're interacting with. Uh, or you could play it in a way where, you know, you don't care about anything because it's all fake or what have you. But which way you decide to play it, I think helps form your character that you're going to carry with you even outside of that video game. Because your, your spiritual being and your spiritual wisdom that you're, that you're using to direct your actions in those video games, that's the same character that you're going to carry with you afterward in other situations. I couldn't agree with you more, Sharon. I think that's very well said. My son plays video games with an Oculus, and so he's totally absorbed in it. And if he is going around shooting people in that game in which he's completely absorbed, how can that violence not somehow be absorbed into his mind when he takes the Oculus off and goes out and into the world? Is he somehow, for example, desensitized against violence because he's played it in this immersive experience? And so what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yes, it's a dream, but we can play it with some ethics and some love and forgiveness yeah. and care and healing for each other. Well said, yeah. Well, and I think that maybe the primary revelation that we should have if we come to the conclusion that life is but a dream is that we don't need to be afraid anymore. It's not that, well, now I can go out and I can hurt whoever I want because they're not real. No, the idea is that we don't have to fear that someone is going to hurt us and we can be the love 
that we innately are towards other people. Aaron, if you're not a core student, you sure <laughs> as hell should be. <laughs> because that's, that's exactly why we bring it. people on the show, actually, is <laughs> just we're just on a conversion program one by one. <laughs> Um, See, that's exactly but I, it. But I that's think it's. Domestic. I mean, I think it's great that we're having this conversation with me really not having much of a background in this. Yeah. Because because these are conclusions that I've come to from independent reflection and you know looking at what evidence I've been able to find. So yeah, it. I think it speaks a lot to the the truth of the course. That's it's interesting because I was thinking it's actually better that you're not very familiar at all. You know it. it gives an independence to it. But just as an aside, what you were talking about just now is basically the course's philosophy of forgiveness. In other words, mm. since what's happening to me in this dream is just a dream, I don't have to hold resentment inside. I can forgive the other person because they didn't, they just did it in a dream. Um, their mind is real. They're a fellow dreamer, Yeah. but their body and the actions in this world and so on are not real. And that's why I can let it go and love them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Once you, once you're able to view the world from that bigger perspective where there's so much more than just, you know, our little ego here in this little physical world, then it's like well, that stuff that that person did to me, doesn't even matter in it, but like, it's just so small in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So do you see evidence that our nature, whatever we are, is more unlimited than what it seems while we're in these bodies and that it is in the ultimate sense, perhaps spiritual and maybe even divine? Yeah, I think, um, again, it goes back to a lot of the things that people have experienced in their near-death experiences that it not just like merging with the divine, but it's really interesting to see how when people die, their perception just breaks wide open. So, so many people talk about not only they're able to see things more clearly or they're able to think more clearly or faster, but they can actually uh, perceive like with 360 degree vision. Mm -hmm. so they're not looking with their eyes anymore. Somehow they're seeing the room all at once and they're able to see more detail than they could ever see before. Like some ND ear, um, I think his name is Tom Sawyer, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but he's not a fictional character. Um, but he said that when he had his life review in his NDE, he saw the events of his life in way more detail than when he had originally been living through them to the point where he could have counted the mosquitoes that were present when certain things were happening. Yeah, I that has fascinated me because he also said there was that incident where he he punched out a guy on the road. Um, and he said he was seeing it from many perspectives at once. He was in his own body. Mm -hmm. He was in the other guy's body. He was hovering about 50 feet in the air. He was seeing things from this dispassionate, non-judgmental perspective, all these multiple perspectives at once. At and once. our minds yeah. don't have the capacity for that right now. No, no. Or at least we're we're sort of stuck in one little backwater of our limitless minds. And while we're stuck over here, we can't access that. Um, I really like the, the, I'm sure you're familiar with it, the filter theory of consciousness, mm -hmm. this idea that, that our brains uh, actually filter our um, more, more limitless consciousness uh, down to just focusing on the things that are relevant to the physical survival of our body. So we may all be these limitless beings, or at least these, these beings with m many fewer limits than what we think of, um, but we're unaware of it right now because we're just so focused on the video game. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you have this ability to not only see it in 360 degrees, but to see from lots of different people's perspectives and to somehow be able to, to integrate those things, to under, to be a consciousness that encompasses all of them at once. And and the years will say that they suddenly knew the answers to everything in the entire universe. They knew everything. Like, I, I don't even know... 
I don't know how you would know that you know everything, but <laughs> but they say a lot of crazy things. It's quite possible that they do that. This there's somehow they know that they know everything. And then other people will say they don't necessarily know everything, but as soon as a question comes into their mind, the answer arrives. Mm -hmm. So they at least have access to that limitless mind, even if it's not currently present in their consciousness. Yeah. Oh, there's so much more we could say about that, but but maybe we should keep, we're not going to be able to get through all of our topics as it is. Uh, Emily, do you want to pick up with a, with a question? Yeah. So Sharon, you may or may not know that the course purports to come from Jesus, um, channeled from Jesus. And yeah. so- a Bit of a I'm, controversial claim. Yes, it is a bit, of, yeah, that's something that's a kind of an eyebrow raiser to- Wait, I mean, within the course, is that a controversial claim or that's just- from people from outside both not so m yeah. both i mean i think most course students accept the claim um mm -hmm. although or avoid it, the question <laughs> avoid the question or or redefine it um but i think once you step outside of the course community it it's like whoa. it's just a wild yeah, right. blasphemous claim right uh, and yet you know our view is that it, People claim that Jesus talks to them all the time. Why wouldn't he yeah. come through a, a psychologist in, in New York? Anyway, um, you had mentioned Jesus just a few minutes ago in passing. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious for all of us how much Jesus shows up. And if we're doing this podcast on evidence for spiritual truth, do we have evidence of his existence in the work that you've done? Well, First of all, I would say that just based on the fact that our consciousness doesn't disappear when we die, that Jesus does still exist. <laughs> um, mm. So just like all of us are still going to exist when we die, like Jesus consciousness is still around now in what form and what is he doing? That's a further question. But first of all, yeah, let's just say that the evidence points to him still existing. Um, now, he does seem to show up pretty frequently. I mean, frequently um, uh, in near-death experiences, um, not, as, as, not anywhere nearly as frequently as a divine being. Um, but there are a fair number of near-death experiences where people say that they talk to Jesus. Now, again, it's not clear if it was actually Jesus or it was this was the easiest way for higher consciousness to present itself to them or whether that was just their interpretation of the being that they saw, like they expected that they would meet Jesus. So they see a guy in a robe and they assume it's Jesus. Um, or maybe it was just an angel or who knows. So there are some difficult interpretive questions when people talk about experiencing Jesus and including with waking visions that people have, because certainly people have had visions of Jesus while they are awake, um, or they have had um, important uh, sleeping visions, dreams of Jesus. Um, I think in particular of a guy named Andy Paquette, who's written a really mm -hmm. excellent book um, about his many years of psychic dreams. He was an atheist um, and didn't actually believe in anything paranormal until his wife made him start writing down his dreams because she's like, you're having dreams about the future and you need to know it. So he started writing them down to prove her wrong um, and turned out that, no, he really was having dreams of the future. And what's interesting is that even though he was an atheist, he had a lot of very religious dreams. And Jesus particularly um, featured in these dreams. He was very uncomfortable with this um, and still is, honestly. I've corresponded with him some. And because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to be seen as spreading a, you know, a religion or anything. Mm -hmm. But he said, but, you know, I know my dreams. I know that the things in them have come true. And in some of those dreams that have dramatically been shown to be true, Jesus was a central figure. Uh, for instance, he had a dream about the tsunami in Southeast Asia, you know, a decade or so ago, and before it happened. And in the dream, he was told that this tsunami would be a sign that, um, that Jesus was going to return soon. So here, here's this atheist having a dream about the tsunami, 
Jesus is going to return soon. Then the tsunami happens. And I mean, it's like, well, I mean, what is is soon? (laughs) Uh, What is going to happen? I don't, I don't even know what to do with this. Um, now, and would the herald of his return be something so destructive? Well, painful? yeah, I mean, so so I think there are lots of different ways that you can look at this. One of the most useful ways that I have personally found um, is something that Nancy Evans Bush talked about in one of her books on near-death experience and, and sort of the, the sort of spiritual contradictions, paradoxes that you can see uh, between different people's near-death experiences. And she said that some of the, or that often the spiritual imagery that people experience is much more about their personal spiritual journey than it is about some you know, grand event that's going to happen in the world, which made me wonder whether these dreams that Paquette was having about Jesus coming was not about Jesus coming on the clouds you know, the way that we think of, you know, in the, from the book of Revelation, um, but that it was about Jesus taking up residence in his own life and changing things in his life, which w- would go along with a psychological um, or a symbol, symbolic interpretation of the tsunami as well. If Jesus is like a tsunami coming into his life and like washing away all of his old ways of thinking about things, then it would make total sense that his dream would Mm. pair these two things together. Maybe Um, so. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I I don't think he himself is amenable to that interpretation, (laughs) but, uh, but I think when, when you're talking about NDEs, when you're talking about dreams, um, when you're talking about coincidences, even when you're talking about physical events in this world, I think that you've got to look at the symbolic interpretations. You've got to look at the deeper spiritual and personal meaning of the events involved. So, yeah. In light of your story, it's interesting. <laughs> it might be interesting for you to note that the, the channel of the course, a woman by the name of Helen Shuckman referred to herself as a militant atheist and was uncomfortable with, with Jesus as the author for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and and that does seem like the most convincing way if Jesus wants to show up and send a message. The most convincing way is to find somebody that doesn't believe in him, doesn't want these messages um, and to come through anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a pattern that I see where a lot of people who have experiences of Jesus in dreams or visions or NDEs are not believers at the time. Uh, You know, I've heard that a a large percentage of people who are in Christian churches and Muslim countries are there because they had some kind of inner experience of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of my favorite, I mean, a lot of the NDE stories where Jesus appears are not to Christians. One of my favorite ones is there's this British woman and he shows up in her NDE and and she says, hang on, uh, but I'm, I'm not one of yours. Right. Um, what are you doing in my indie? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he says, but I'm one of yours, mm. which I thought was great. It's like, I'm part of your social circle, even mm. if you don't see yourself as part of my flock of followers. Mm. Uh, and yeah. you see that, I, I'm sure you know about Howard Storms. Mm-hmm. NDE. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was a hardcore atheist right. and uh, he's a Christian minister decades later now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the other thing is then you, you do have stories about people who see Muhammad in mm. a dream or in an NDE and or Elvis Islam or Elvis. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah. <laughs> um, not necessarily an, an NDE. I don't know if I've seen. Yeah, one of right. those. Does um, Elvis have his own religion that they can convert to? <laughs> <laughs> but certainly there, there was um, that story that Raymond Moody uh, collected about that. Um, that father whose son had like run away from home and the father started having dreams about Elvis telling him how to find his son. And yeah. so when he followed the instructions in the dream, he found his son like out in LA or something. And then his son was like, dad, I've got to tell you something. Um, I was having these dreams about Elvis and he told me that you would be coming to get me. Mm. So, so well. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, it, it could, it could be, it's it could be elvis i mean elvis 
goes on just like the rest of us. So it very well could be Elvis. It, it could also be just a way for, you know, another higher consciousness to, to make itself known to him. So, yeah. it, but well, as we were talking about at the very beginning, you know, ultimately we're all part of this non-dual consciousness. So this question of, well, was it really him or was it someone else? And at a certain level, the question doesn't matter that much because yeah. we're all in this together. We're all working towards the same end. That's, Unless that's... you're an Elvis fan. <laughs> what? In which case, Unless... well, <laughs> in which case it better be him. Yeah. Right. Well, and I mean, certainly many people who are fans of Jesus would not say, well, it doesn't really matter if it was Jesus or not. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. don't want an Elvis impersonator. I want Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's funny. Uh, so you're talking about the, the higher, these higher beings and, and the forms in which they take. And as we're closing here, can we talk about how, how and whether angels show up mm-hmm. in, uh, is there any evidence for the presence of angels that you know of? Uh, yes. So one of the questions that we have to answer is what do we mean by an angel? Um, we could just mean something very basic, like a spiritual being, um, a messenger, which is what angel means. Um, we could mean, you know, a protector. Uh, and certainly we have instances of all of those things. We have spiritual beings who are bringing true verified messages to people, uh, whether in their NDEs or in their dreams or while they're waking. Uh, we have events of extreme protection of people, you know, people who were, you know, about to run, uh, you know, headfirst into another vehicle in their car, and then suddenly their car is just picked up and moved to another place. Um, So there's just crazy sorts of physical things that... Before you go, Robert, can you define angel from a course Mm -hmm. perspective? Because I think Sharon's point is well taken. Let's talk about what angels mean before we talk about whether there's evidence for them. So right. Well, I think the course's view of angels, I mean, there's not a lot of discussion of angels in the course, but there's a number of references. um, And and it seems that the view is they're a different line of creation than humans, that they were created specifically as, as helpers, messengers, you know, to sort of serve our spiritual journey. Um, And therefore, you know, we don't die and become angels. You know, uh, we don't have bells ring and we get our wings. Um, They're actually like a different order of creation. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly there are experiences that people have had, and I'm thinking particularly of waking visions that people have of angels that, would seem to support the idea that they're just something different than we are because the the visions seem to be very different than when people dream of their departed loved ones or or when they see their departed loved ones as apparitions. So one of the things when people say that they have seen an angel is that uh, the size is often much Mm -hmm. larger than Mm -hmm. life. Um, and, And again, this may be, you know, the, that the being is trying to pro- project this idea of protection and strength, um, which certainly they manage to do because they're often very intimidating, these forms, but they'll, they'll be like twice as tall as a person or even three times as tall as a person. And in fact, they're uh, sometimes they're seen inside, um, but because they're so tall, it's like they go through the ceiling and it's the ceiling sort of disappears around them and the person Mm. can see them, you know, 10 or 20 feet higher than where the ceiling would be. Mm. And a lot of times they will have some sort of, um, they'll have like, uh, weapons or armor, which I think, again, I, I think we probably are in agreement that on the other side, you don't need physical swords or physical, you know, uh, breastplate, like from Roman times. Maybe like uh, Kevlar jackets. <laughs> right. You, it, I haven't heard about that, but that would be really interesting if we got yeah, an would. angel with a Kevlar jacket um, and a machine gun. <laughs> uh, but 
so so there has to be some level of symbolism right that's going on here uh, but the level of symbolism does seem to be on a different order from what we get from people's deceased loved ones who are just coming to say you know i'm with you i'm looking out for you um it's just something different yeah yeah you had a, some great stories in your book on coincidences, but I, I want to move on because Emily, we have time for like one more category, right? We can yeah, squeeze of course. it. Um, do you see evidence, Sharon, for there being some kind of plan for our lives versus it's just all random? I, I love this. I'm, I'm so glad we got to this because this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and this is something that eventually I would love to write a whole book about because there is so much there. So a lot of the evidence for life plans comes from people who have pre-birth memories. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes those are memories like of life between lives where people remember having lived before, but sometimes it's just, they remember, you know, a little, little bit of what happened in heaven before they came into this life. And they remember making choices about who their parents were going to be, uh, who other people in their life were going to be, what friends they were going to have. Like, I remember this one little boy was telling his mom about how he had all these friends in heaven and they had decided that when they came you know, to earth, they were all going to meet up. And she was like, oh, well, which of your friends are the ones that you knew in heaven? And he's like, well, I haven't met them yet. But when I meet them, I will recognize them. Mm. Uh, so, so people make plans to meet certain people and, and they remember it from, from before they were born. Some people have really detailed memories of the pre-birth planning. So they will remember something that's very similar to what NDEers describe, where they actually see their life playing out. Instead of a life review, it's like a life preview. And they see... Um, the various decisions that they could make. They see the way that it's going to affect different people. They see what their reactions are going to be ahead of time. And they can kind of make a, make a choice about, you know, what would be the most important main events to have in this life to get me where I need to go. So some of them will remember some of these events when they come into their life, but then other people will be told about them once they're here. So they don't remember making the plan, but like um, Tom Campbell, I don't know if you know him, he wrote my big uh, yeah, theory sure. of everything. -E so he talks about when he was 14 years old, he, you know, this 14 year old boy, he was like despairing about ever having a girlfriend and he's like, you know, is my love life ever going to get better? <laughs> and at 14? He, yeah, at 14. <laughs> <laughs> But Elvis never, never going to get better, Tom. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, but his he had um, these spiritual guides, maybe angels, maybe something else, um, come to him and say, sort of give him a preview of like 20, 25, 30 years into the future of his life and show him the woman that was going to be the one in his life. And they told him that the woman who's going to be the one, she's only two years old right now. He was 12 years younger than he was. And he got so mad because he was like, I'm paired up with some two-year-old baby. Like this is useless information. <laughs> um, but um, later on in his life, um, he did in his mid thirties, he did meet a woman who was 12 years younger than him mm. and they got married and um, are still married, I believe. Wow. So, oh. and, and there were other details that he was given as well. He was actually told, exactly what age he was going to meet her. Um, and there was another interesting incident when he was in his early twenties, he actually was getting married to another woman and he was getting cold feet. He was like, but this, she's not the one, she's not the one that you told me I would be marrying. So maybe I shouldn't marry her, but his guides assured him that he was supposed to marry her. He says, they said, it's going to be all right you're going to marry her, you're going to have a son, um, and it's not going to last forever, but it's important that you do this. And mm -hmm. sure enough, they did have a son together, and then they ended up uh, divorcing, and then he found the, the one later mm -hmm. on. But it, I feel like it's a story that really shows how there are, even the events in our lives that seem like 
you know, they're disappointments. Um, you know, I'm sure that his first marriage breaking up was a disappointment to him. But even those things are often things that were planned um, and they're put in your life either to, to help you in some way or they're there for you to help somebody else. Hmm. I know we're, we're at, I've got to ask the free will question, Emily. I mean, come well, on. Yeah. Before you ask the free will question, okay. though, okay. One, one other question related to a plan for our life. So for anyone who's listening and they're thinking, I feel so relieved that there is evidence that there is a higher hand at work in the planning and the execution and the decisions that we make in this life. But I just have no clue how to tap into it. What, what would you say to that person? Well, first of all, it is very hard. It's hard for a lot of people. It's very hard for me personally. I am not a very intuitive person, which is part of why I've done all of this research because I don't get a lot of this information for my personal life. Um, although I, I've, I've started getting a little bit more now that I pay attention to my dreams. Um, mm -hmm. So that's probably my, pers my first piece of advice to people is pay attention to your dreams and write them down because a lot of times you will dream about things that then later happen. Sometimes it'll be the same day. Sometimes it won't be for several years in the future. But if you don't write them down, you're going to forget about them. And you're not going to see some of the really close correspondences. So that's the first thing. And pay attention to your dreams. Because sometimes they will give you guidance about things that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, sometimes just to sort of alert you to the possibilities of what may come up and sort of emotionally prepare you for those things. Dreams are important. Um, but also, I mean, this is probably very stereotypical <laughs> spiritual advice, um, meditation, um, but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be super involved meditation. It's just meditation to the point where you're just kind of quieting your mind because, you know, so often through the day, we're just busy with so many different things. And those things are so loud in our minds that it's hard to hear the quieter, softer, more subtle spiritual things um, that are there. But if we can just calm down the other parts of our minds, we can hear that other voice. So, so just take a, take a few minutes every day and just, just relax and be very quiet. And you might be surprised the things that come into your mind. And I'd also add, pay attention to like, take seriously the things that we're talking about here, because as you've learned, and as we've learned, the more you start to say this actually can be and is real, then the realness of it starts to present itself to you. And yeah. if you've got eyes to see and ears to hear, and you pay attention you know, even closer, then you see that more will, will follow. And then you just yeah. take the breadcrumbs through your life. Well, yeah. I think, especially when you're going through a really hard time, when something has happened to you that is, uh, that you hate, and that is just, you know, causing you a lot of suffering, if you can switch gears for a minute and think, well, what if this is something that was planned? What if this is something that is actually a gift? What might that look like? If you can start just considering that possibility, then that opens you up to maybe following a, a, a new path and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. seeing, even creating those good things that can come out of even very difficult situations. Yeah. In the course in Lesson 135, it talks about what, what could you not handle, I'm paraphrasing here, but what could you not handle if you knew that all things were gently planned for your good? Mm. And all, I mean, whew, there's a lot in that all. Yeah, it's like all events, past, present, and to come. Yeah. Okay, so, so you know, I'm a huge believer in there being a plan. I feel like that's one thing I could never doubt. But then there's the question of how like how does free will intersect with that? Is there free will? And if there is, doesn't, wouldn't it throw a monkey wrench into the plant? So what are your thoughts about that? I think there absolutely is free will. And 
I think that sometimes it can throw a monkey wrench into the plans and the plans have to get kind of recalculated to deal with wh where we go, but that's okay. Um, free will is part of the plan. We're supposed to make choices from the perspective of actually being in this life and experiencing things. So from what I can tell, generally, the larger events in our life are planned out. Things like who we're going to meet, um, you know, when important people to us are going to leave our lives. Um, all those sort of meetings and partings and probably the big events of our profession um, or children, those sorts of things. But then the stuff in between, we get to improvise with. We get to um, figure out some of the smaller things that we're going to choose. And I think the most important thing that we choose is how we're going to feel about all of the things that happen to us. Because two people can experience the very same set of events in their life. And one of them can be very happy and calm and peaceful. And one of them can be bitter and rageful and just unhappy their entire life. And the most important piece of free will that we have is to take the events that come to us in our life and to say, well, I'm going to receive this as a gift and I am going to use every chance that I have to give such gifts to others. I've been listening to over the last couple of days, uh, watching an interview with Nancy Rines. She's an NDE. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's a really well-produced uh, interview by Anthony Shane. He's done a whole series of very well-produced uh, interviews, with, often with NDEers. And she's talking about how she gets the other side during her NDE. And, and a teacher appears and says, I'm going to prepare you to go back. And she's like, I'm not going back. And the teacher says, well, you already agreed to go back. And she's like, I didn't agree to no such thing. And so the teacher said, you agreed to it before this life. And so Nancy, as, as you may well know, had been an atheist um, and the teacher brought her back to the planning stage for her present mm -hmm. life. And in that planning, she drifts away from spirituality, becomes an atheist. And then she has three opportunities to get back to a more spiritually aligned life. One's in her teens and she blows past that, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't do it, you know? Yeah. The other one's when her father dies and she doesn't do it then either. And so like the NDE was like the final fail safe, hmm. I guess, maybe mm -hmm. if needed. So yeah. there you get a real sense of the interplay between free will and the plan. Yeah. Yeah. There do seem to be those backup plans, um, different yeah. strategies, it, each kind of increasing in intensity. And I've certainly heard people say, um, based on their own experience, like, when spirit tells you something, listen the first time because it's going to get more and more uncomfortable mm. until you pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah. I, I know. I keep throwing... We're going to get, we're going to be on our path. We're going to get to our path. But if, again, we can experience more or less pain on our way there. Yeah. I know I keep throwing course quotes at you, Sharon, but Robert, how does the quote end? Trials are but lessons presented once again so that. Crossword lessons that you failed to learn presented once again, so that where you made a faulty choice before, you now can make a better one and thus escape all pain and misery that what you chose before brought to you. There you have it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, Robert, did you have any other? I questions? think we probably yeah, should. I mean, well I do. I do. I have a lot I know. more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Robert's been very excited to have you on the show, Sharon, because this is obviously an area of, of deep an enduring interest for, for him and for us, for us both. So, well, it's a whole side. I mean, this is what started my spiritual life and it remains this whole side of, uh, of my spiritual life, but we don't talk about this in, in our classes. And so to have somebody, I mean, you've written a short time, Sharon, you have just, I don't know how you've done it, immersed yourself and become a veritable encyclopedia of these kinds of experiences and categories of experiences that I didn't even know were categories yeah <laughs> you know and you write about them in a very lucid way and you think them through in a really intelligent way so yeah i've been looking yeah. forward to this yeah and sharon i'll just add on top of this robert and i have been threatening to do a podcast called halting the advancement of civilization and and, and the idea is that 
if we don't have a more expanded view of what reality is, then we will continue to live in the world that we live in now where the concerns are so narrowed to the self. You were mm-hmm. talking earlier about the filter theory where it's like all, all of consciousness that can kind of get through the straw <laughs> to us is, is by the time it comes down, all we care about is the needs of this body. Yeah. And until and unless we get a bigger view of what is real, then we will have this place where civilization itself is halted. Like we can't go further. And so I just, I know it's a brave thing for, for you to uh, leave academia, to go off on your own and to write and speak on these things, because maybe if you're, uh, circles or anything like ours, it's tough to, I was just saying to you before we hit record, it's tough to say to your parents who want you to live a quote unquote normal life, no, I'm going to go off and study paranormal things, <laughs> or I'm going to leave, in my case, I'm going to leave this very lucrative career to teach a book called A Course in Miracles. Yeah. And everyone looks at you like you're crazy. And until society itself goes into, moves into more of a spiritual worldview where these things aren't crazy, they're just how it is, then that's when society will advance. And so I just, you're a trailblazer in, in that regard, as far as we're concerned. Thank you for the work that you do, because it's because of you and the, 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 the cogent nature of your arguments and the intelligence of your writing that paves the way for us to say God exists, Jesus exists, mm-hmm. Holy Spirit exists, and, and to have that be taken seriously because you're kind of cutting the path for it in the world. And so just thank you for that on behalf of Robert and I and all of us here at The Circle. Well, thank you very much um, for for recognizing the worth of what I do because a lot of the time you know you you sit in a corner researching and writing and you're like is this ever going to make a difference to anyone else and it really it makes a difference to me to know that 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 work is helping somebody else and, and helping a whole group of people so thank yeah. you very much yeah. until we, we meet again corner... <laughs> go ahead Robert. I was gonna say we sat in the corner with some similar thoughts haven't we <laughs> <laughs> daily <laughs> yeah <laughs> So anyway, Sharon, I, I hope that we were able to do this again at some point. So thank you once Thanks again so for your work and for being on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you guys.